Hello. This part of the Native American Special Gender series will look at the third gender, born as male but living as female, in North America. The American Southwest and the Great Plains have many Native societies that recognize third gender, and this episode will explore cases from both regions. Western North America has been especially important for understanding the concept, for not only the great number of cultures that express it, but also the amount of research that has been conducted among them. A common belief among the Native societies from North to South America is that the third gender exists because it has spiritual origins, and this similarly holds for the fourth gender, the masculine female. This is to say, special Native American genders have a sacred foundation, often explained through myths about the separation of the genders and then the following creation of the third and or fourth. Even if they are already socially accepted, their divine origins give them further weight. Myths from the American Southwest tell of third-gender people coming into the world as mediators. And I acknowledge the studies by Walter Williams for these Southwestern examples. The Navajo or Diné have an account of the mythical people First Man, First Woman, and the twins White Shell Girl and Turquoise Boy. As Turquoise Boy began to assume women's activities, such as grinding maize and making clothes, he became the first Nagle, the Diné third gender. Turquoise Boy, in fact, became so efficient in the distaff that the Diné men decided that they no longer needed the women. And so they lived separately from the women for four years until the men realized that they were missing them, and it was up to Turquoise Boy to reunite the genders. The Zunyi also have a mythical origin tale for their third gender in Kohlamana, a Kachina spirit that had been kidnapped by a rival group of hunter spirits. Once Kohlamana discovered a way to resolve the tensions between the two spirit factions, he settled peace between them. In the ceremonial dances for Kohlamana, it was a Hlamana, a third gender, who took the ritual role. If the third gender originated from the actions of spirits during mythical times, this figure could remain engaged with spiritual beings in the present day. Native societies of the American Great Plains regard vision experiences as profoundly personal and transformative, and this extends to visions that could turn a man into third gender. In these visions, the subject encounters a powerful animal spirit, such as the buffalo or elk, that often took the form of a woman. She then gifts him with supernatural abilities, and this magical transition into a sacred actor, like a medicine man, also shifts his gender from male to not male, namely the third gender. The idea that this person now contained both male and female spiritual aspects is where the popular phrase two-spirit originates. Examples have occurred among the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Lakota, and the latter have a detailed picture of what the newly transitioned third gender could become for her community. Because of the nature of the visionary encounter with the spirits, the Lakota third gender has permanently opened her gateway to the worlds beyond where the forces that govern the natural world exist with human personalities and appearance. She thus becomes an agent to mediate between the human and spirit worlds to ensure healthy relations between the community and nature. So, rather than being shunned as a freakish social reject, the third gender often had a respected role, a part to play in our society. This drawing by the famous ethnographer George Catlin illustrates a Lakota ceremony to formally present the third gender, or wing te, as a holy woman for the community. In many cases, the candidate had already been acting like a woman since his earliest childhood. The induction ceremony just formally confers her status. The third gender could marry a man or woman. Although from a strictly biological stance, marriage to a man would be same-sex, community members still regarded a heterogender relationship, and this could extend to marriage with a woman. This photo is of Oshtish at left, who was a bate, or third gender among the Crow, with her wife. Of course, every indigenous language had its own word for the third gender person, yet for especially the North American cases, anthropologists used the technical term burdash, notably to highlight her typically spiritual status. However, by the 1990s, Native activists challenged whether this term was appropriate, given its connotation as a sexually submissive man. Recalling the experiences described earlier, two-spirit has instead become a more popular phrase among First Nations, Canadian Aboriginals, and mainstream culture. However, even this is complicated, for not all Native societies are unanimous about how a person becomes third or fourth gender. The spiritual association is common, but not universal, and still among these cases, the twin spirit does not always accurately describe how the person's nature is understood within their own culture's framework. 
This was an argument made among the Inuit of Nunavut, who recognize special genders but yet point out that twin spirit is an external idea that does not represent local gender beliefs. An additional note about the Inuit third gender Sipinik and the fourth gender Sipiyuk is that they were temporary and occurred only among children, who were expected to resume their birth assigned genders by adulthood. Because Burdash is pejorative and two-spirit is imprecise, I have been using third and fourth gender, which I hope you find both fair and consistent. The next episode will look at special gender concepts in Mesoamerica, with specific attention to ancient myth and modern third gender. Join us for the following installment.